So I would like to give you a little whirlwind tour of the discovery of C60. Um, I was really fortunate to play a small role in this whole story. So it's lovely to be able to come up here and talk about it. In fact, I go around talking about this to schools and colleges and anyone who would listen, really. Um, Harry is probably most famous for the discovery of C60, this beautiful sphere, 60 carbon atoms on what's called a truncated icosahedron. And it's related, as we've seen with the, with the last talk, to all sorts of other structures in nature, and particularly geodesic domes. And Buckminster Fuller, who was world famous inventor of the geodesic dome, some of his ideas were influential in understanding the structure of this beautiful molecule, so they named it after him. Unfortunately, Buckminster Fuller died two years before C60 was discovered. And uh, that's a shame, because I think he would have had some incredible insights. He was a very, very interesting man. And, um, I think there's a parallel between, I've got to know some of the people who worked with Richard Buckminster Fuller, and there's a sort of interesting parallel, I think, between the people who worked with Fuller and, and Harry Croto, that, you know, if you spend some time with them, I think you're never the same again. In a good way, I mean. Um, they were wonderful people, creative people, open-minded people. Uh, you could ask them any question. And there was nothing you couldn't answer, uh, ask. There was nothing stupid. You know, any question was important. And I love that about Harry. And we all miss that. You're know, just going for Harry for a coffee. You could ask him any question, and he'd have, he'd have an interesting reply, and, and he would take you seriously. The story starts in space, or at least the C60 story starts in space. There was a wonderful collaboration in the 1970s with Harry uh, between chemists, astronomers, physicists, and chemists, and spectroscopists. And Harry was, uh, Harry's colleague at Sussex University was David Wharton. David Wharton was an expert in long-chain carbon molecules, polyacetylenes or polyenes. And uh, Dave Wharton would make these with his student. And because they have a long, straight shape, they have a very interesting spectra. In a gas phase, when they tumble and rotate, because they're, they're, they've got an unsymmetrical uh, distribution of charge, they've got a dipole moment. So one, char one end of the molecule is more charged than another. As they tumble and rotate in the gas phase, they look like a little electric current. So they emit radio waves or emit ra uh, radiation. So these molecules that uh, Dave Wharton were making, uh, he'd give to Harry, Harry would measure the spectrum in basically a microwave spectrometer, a radio frequency. And these molecules, when they tumble and rotate, uh, give out radio waves. And the information, because as we said earlier, you can measure frequency incredibly precisely, you get incredible detail about the shape of the molecule, the dimensions, the bond lengths and everything. But what's wonderful, of course, is you can give these same frequencies to the radio astronomers who can look out into space and detect these molecules in space. So it's an incredible experiment, sort of cosmic experiment, because you're measuring some of the smallest things, molecules, but then you can look out into space and map galaxies in terms of the radiation from these molecules. It's absolutely tremendous. Really fantastic. And if you look at, this is a bit out of date, but this is a, a list of the molecules that have been detected in space, m lots of them by this so-called radio astronomy. A cursory glance, you see how many of these molecules have carbon in it. So Harry was fascinated about carbon. How could carbon form so much in the universe? So he, what he wanted to do was um, he'd like to get a bit of carbon, fire a high-powered laser beam at it, maybe heat the carbon up, to the temperature of the surface of a star, 20,000 degrees, and look to see what comes off, to see if you could understand how these molecules could form in space. And uh, he was able to do that um, because in 1985, Rick Smalley in uh, Rice University had built this incredible machine, which was basically almost perfect for this experiment. So what you've got is a stainless steel apparatus here with pumps on it. So if you like, this sort of represents the vacuum of space. But over here, you can put a sample and fire a laser beam, just like this laser pointer. Um, pulse the laser. So you blast the surface of your sample. It's swept into this vacuum chamber where it's all frozen. But unlike space, of course, on the lab, you can hang a machine on it, a mass spectrometer, and have a look at what's produced. And Harry got uh, time for one week to go over to Rice University to study carbon. They hated doing carbon because it fills the machine with carbon. They have to take it apart and clean it. But, so it took a while to get permission. But they stuck carbon in here, and it was obvious right from the beginning that something amazing was taking place. The spectrum of carbon was wonderfully rich uh, and rewarding. And they understood a lot about carbon chains during this research, but in this one week of creative activity, they also discovered something else. They discovered completely by accident the buckyballs form. The carbon sheets would form and roll up to form a beautiful molecule. 
Um, so this is the spectra that they got from the machine. Remember, this is the output of the machine is a mass spectrometer, so you just get a graph. So on this scale, you've got the strength of the signal. On this scale, it's actually called time of flight, but basically it represents the size of the molecule. So these peaks here, going up and down, are all spaced one carbon atom apart. So this might be C6, C7, C8, C9, C10. The signal sort of basically disappears around about 20 carbon atoms, where there's a sort of cutoff. And then there's a whole new distribution of particles which have a different spacing. They really look, do look very different from these. Here the spacing is two carbon atoms. Massive peak at C60 and enormous peak at C70. What could it be? Um, we actually know this is the first, this spectra had been seen before by other groups, but they hadn't recognized it was special. And how he thought this was something special, what could uh, explain this enormous stability for C60? They never saw C59 or C61. There's something amazing about C60. We actually know C60's birthday, because this is the first time it was really recognized. And in this mass range, at least, you know, the, it seemed to be the dominant peak. C70 always there also. They knew they were vaporizing graphite. It was pure graphite. And they knew they didn't really have any other uh, chemicals in the machine. And if you look at a 60-atom sheet, there's nothing that tells you that this should be stable. If you think of a sheet like this, it's got this edge, which would just grow. So there's no reason why that would be stable. But they thought, well, maybe... Harry was thinking, maybe if the whole group was thinking, maybe if you could join these atoms to these atoms and these atoms onto these atoms and somehow curve it up into a ball, maybe you could account for its stability because then it wouldn't want to grow. Um, and, but there's no way you can do that without cheating. As you can see, you can sort of kind of bend it this way, but it doesn't look like a cage. And Harry remembered the structures built by Richard Buckminster Fuller. Uh, very interesting man. Uh, not easy to read. I don't know if any of you read his masterwork, Synergy. He's fond of 200-word sentences, it's, uh, and every word means something. But he is a fascinating character, and behind him here is a geodesic dome. Perhaps the most famous is the one he made in Montreal, 200-foot high geodesic dome, the Epcot Centre in Disneyland. And if you go to the UK, you can go to the Eden Project. It looks a bit better than this. This is when they were making it. Um, but if you look at this, these geodesic domes that Buckminster Fuller made, they do look like they're made of hexagons. So if they can somehow work out how buttons to Fuller made a round structure out of, out of hexagons, could we work out how carbon might do it from a hexagon sheet? And um, if you look at Buckminster Fuller's plans, this is looking down on a dome, and this is looking side on. Right on the top of the dome, yeah, I mean, you've got hexagons here. They join them up, triangulated them to make them very rigid. But right on the top, you see you've got a pentagon. And actually, you've got another five pentagons around here. So to make half a ball a dome, you need uh, six pentagons. If you put two domes together, you've got 12 pentagons, and it rolls up into a ball. Um, so hexagons on their own are flat, as you can see very clearly from this model. But if I take this edge together and bring it together to transform this into a five-membered ring and let it rearrange, which I've done in red here, you can see that the pentagon there you form curves the whole thing up. Each time you put a pentagon in, it curves it a bit more, and 12 pentagons will roll it up. You can cover the whole of the USA in pentagons, and it'll be flat. 12 pentagons will roll it up. Um, presumably one at the pentagon. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> So 12 pentagons, it's not obvious, but if you look at a soccer ball, it's made of 12 black pentagon patches and there's 20 white hexagon patches. But it's not obvious, but there's no corner that isn't in a pentagon. So there aren't any other corners. So if you imagine putting a ball at each of the corners of the pentagons, you end up with this structure, which of course, has, uh, because there's 12 pentagons and there's five corners in the pentagon, 12 times five is 60 and you've got a solution for the peak of C60. Beautiful, elegant solution, fantastic symmetry. Each pentagon is isolated by one edge. Uh, these happen to be the double bonds or the single bonds are in the pentagons. Um, so you've got a fantastic solution for this peak at C60. When you're playing around with models, and Harry had this wonderful, he got his graduate students to buy a load of molecular models and play for about months, and they found that if you made C62, you always had two pentagons close together. C64 always had two pentagons side by side, C and so on, until C70, when they were all separated again, like in the football. So there's this idea of the pentagon isolation rule. The pentagons like to keep away from each other. First time they can do that in carbon is C60, where all the pentagons are separated by one edge, and the second time is C70, and that's the second peak on this wonderful mass spectrometer, uh, spectrum. So you've got two solutions. Because Buckminster Fuller's ideas were so important, 
They named it Buckminster Fullerene after Richard Buckminster Fuller. C60, of course, because it's 60 atoms. And he was called Bucky to his friends, so it's sometimes called the Bucky Ball. In fact, he's got lots of other names. The IUPAC name is almost impossible to remember. Um, but there's Fullerene 60, Soccer Balling, Bucky Balls, Fullerene 60. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So now you've got three allotropes of carbon. Diamond and graphite, of course, are the two pure forms of carbon you learn when you start science, really. And you understand why they're so different in structure because of the way the atoms are packed together. And so suddenly you've got a third form of carbon appearing in 1985. Uh, by the way, uh, this is the icosahedron. It's got 12 corners, 20 triangles. Uh, each corner has got five edges coming to a point. So if you get a sharp knife and you cut off this corner, truncate it, mathematicians call, and you go round the 12 corners of the icosahedron truncating it, you end up with a pentagon at each corner and hexagons between the, the, the pentagons. And you end up a structure with 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons. So the mathematical name for football isn't a soccer ball. It's a truncated icosahedron. You knew that, right? Um, the jump from the Earth to a football is about the same jump as a football to a large molecule. You're down on a thousandth of a millimetre scale, nanoscale. So it's a new area of nanotechnology. So it's a wonderful visual way of getting this message across to kids, the jump, the gap between the, our world, football and molecules. Um, there's a whole family of cages are possible, of course. They've all got 12 pentagons for the car pure carbon fullerenes. They've got a different number of hexagons. C60, if you like, the head of the family, Buckminster fullerene. And these other cages are now called the fullerenes, a whole uh, family of possible cages, all with interesting properties. You can make bigger ones as well by adding more hexagons. You can see where the curvature is, where the pentagons. Still got 12 pentagons, but a different number of hexagons. So... Um, if you go back in time and imagine Galileo looking up at the moon for the telescope and seeing the moon and discovering for the first time the mountains and the craters properly. The uh, experiment in 1985 had discovered C60. But if you did the calculations, the amount of C60 being produced was very small. Remember, it's a mass spectrometer that is exquisitely sensitive. It can pick up a nanogram of material, perhaps less. So that first experiment in 85 didn't represent a way of making large quantities, a test tube of C60. So it's a bit like Galileo looking at the moon. He's, he's looking at the moon, but he can't go to the moon. You need an Apollo mission to take you there. And the next stage comes from Wolfgang Kretschmer and Donald Huffman's wonderful carbon arc experiment. I arrived at Sussex University in the end of 89. Harry, I, I studied physics. Uh, I wanted to do astronomy degree. And I had an interview at Sussex, which went very well. But they phoned me up a couple of weeks later and said, there's this chap in chemistry called Harry Croto, and he wants a, a physicist to, to study carbon in space. And these were going to be my two stars, Arcor Borealis and IRC 10216. They're stars in space pumping out, spewing out tons of carbon. In fact, th there's so much carbon coming off Arcor Borealis, it blocks the light. So if you measure the light from, with a telescope, it's all over the place because there's tons of soot basically coming off this star. So Harry thought these were the places you might look if C60 was in space. And in fact, if you look at these beautiful pictures, these dark places aren't where there aren't any stars. It's where there's dust in space, and dust is very important. Around about 89, Wolfgang Kratschmer and Donald Huffman had been studying making carbon dust to try and match it up with the dust that they'd seen in space. And they had a very simple apparatus, two carbon rods. In fact, I'll go to the next slide, and then you can see it. It's basically a glass bell jar. You, you set up two carbon rods. You stick about five kilowatts of electricity in there. You've got a spark at the contact. That spark is two or 3,000 degrees centigrade. It vaporizes the carbon. If you did it in air, it will burn, of course. But if you fill this bell jar up with helium, it's inert gas, the helium takes the energy away, and it can nucleate back together, and you get soot. So you get a fine black soot. And in 1989, they published, they didn't publish a paper in a journal, but they went to a conference called Dusty Objects in the Universe. And they presented data where they think that they produce C60 from this carbon arc. And um, my first, within the first few months of arriving at Sussex, Harry had received a copy of this paper, and he said, I don't know if this is going to work, but give it a go. It doesn't look very likely, but it might work. And with Ahmad Sarkar, we spent hundreds of hours of vaporizing carbon and measuring the spectrum. If you could make a molecule, um, one of the measurements you can do is to measure how it absorbs in the infrared. And the nice thing about infrared spectroscopy is it's not too sensitive. It's not like mass spectrometry or in ultraviolet. So if you can measure the infrared spectrum, it shows you've got quite a bit, not tons, 
but it's actually it's insensitivity is actually rather handy because if you're a student um, and you can make this thing you can use it and, and know that there's quite a lot of c60 there this sheet if you do the mathematical group theory, it should have about 25 bands in the infrared. This looks like C60, but it's actually not. The pentagons are in pairs, and it forms a sort of pincushion. It's not likely to be stable at all. But if you do the group theory in that, it should have 22 infrared active bands. But C60, because it's so beautifully symmetrical, it ends up with just four little four absorptions in the infrared. So if you could find a way of making this, infrared spectroscopy would be really, really important in hunting it down. And it was for us. And the wonderful thing about an infrared spectrometer is they're often in the corner of a lab. And after about 9 o'clock, everyone's gone home. You can spend the whole night playing with the infrared spectrometer. You don't have to pay for it. And you can just use it and do run after run and measure the spectrum. Where if you submit samples for mass spec or NMR, you, you know, you're going to pay for it. And they're going to get fed up with you submitting your tenth sample of the day or something. Here I could just play with the infrared spectrometer. So we blasted the carbon. Usually we just got an absorption in the infrared like this. But every so often we saw four little bands. And every time we got that spectrum, I scraped the soot off and put it into a little pot. I wrote to Wolfgang Kratschmer, told him we'd re reproduced his work. We also managed to get the mass spec at 720. And he, Wolfgang Kratschmer wrote back to me with a copy of this paper, which they just sent to be published, where they'd made C60 at normal carbon-12, but then they'd spend a lot of money and bought some carbon-13, made carbon rods out of it and vaporised it so that you make a heavy buckyball. So in the, in, the ultraviolet won't be affected by this, but if it's a heavier molecule, more massive, all the infrared uh, peaks should just shift by the root of the mass, the change in the mass. And that's exactly what they found when they measured the infrared spectrum of C60, the heavy one, carbon-13, all the frequencies were shifted by 1.04, which if you take the root of 13 over 12 is 1.04. So it's a beautiful, beautiful result. Easy to say, hard to do. And what's wonderful is, because I'd written to him, there in the references was me. They'd actually referenced me, which, you know, in the first few months of my PhD, I had my name on a paper. It was such a boost. It was just the most wonderful, wonderful, kind thing that they could have done. But, of course, it got us excited. And in uh, August um, 1990, I had a little precious pot of this soot, and we decided, I decided to shake it up with benzene, stick it on the shelf, and go home for the weekend. When I came in on Monday morning, the soot had settled and there was a coloured solution. Coloured solution from pure carbon. And it was amazing. We knew we didn't have anything else in it. Harry and I were a little bit worried that it might be a colloidal suspension of small particles. But it didn't really matter because within a week, Wolfgang Kratschmer had sent the paper to Nature and Nature had sent the copies to Harry to review. And Wolfgang, they'd done the same thing. If you put a drop of that liquid from the soot on the microscope slide, the crystals uh, the solvent evaporates and you get these beautiful little crystals and you stick a crystal in an electron microscope you can actually see the buckyballs put together like a crazy snooker table. Um, Roger Taylor at Sussex then discovered that if you put it on a chromatography column you can actually separate out the fullerenes. C60 comes through first and it's the most exquisite magenta colour and of course so you now you have a bulk way of making effectively gram quantities of C60. Not only is it beautiful, it produces beautiful coloured solutions. And because it's in chemistry, it, it's dissolved up, you can do chemistry. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, 1990, uh, 1996, Harry, Rick Smalley and Bob Curl get the Nobel Prize for the discovery of C60. And of course, I think his life changed them. The telephones never stopped ringing. They rang a lot before, but it was an amazing time. And we went along to Stockholm to see him get the Nobel Prize. It was absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing. So it has a rich, interesting chemistry. Um, and of course, we spent a lot of time doing loads and loads of measurements on it. One of the things I'm most happy about is the NMR. Because C60 had all the atoms are equivalent, it should produce one peak in the NMR, carbon NMR. C70, because it's five different types of environment, should produce one, two, three, four, five different uh, absorptions or, um, in, the, in the NMR in a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 to 2. And if you go in, uh, when you actually get the spectrum, you get the five lines in the ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 to 2. And really, there's no other solution apart from the carbon cage hypothesis that fits both the one line C60. I guess this could have been a ring or something, but once you get a five line 
For C70, there's nothing else that could uh, explain it. Nanotubes were discovered in 1991 because of the paradigm shift. Now we have a round world of chemistry. People started looking back at carbon samples and re-looking at stuff they'd already looked at and discovered new things. Graphene appeared in 2010. Uh, a bit before that, got the Nobel Prize in 2010. And we got the whole... I, sometimes I think Harry wrote a lot on the, the smaller fullerenes and they're like little seeds that he's planted that are, are yet to grow. We, 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 people are studying them, but they've yet to be made in bulk quantities. So we have really a carbon revolution that Harry Croteau created. hundred years ago today, almost, Mary Lee Hegger, who's an astronomer, discovered uh, a whole range of absorptions through the visible on various astronomical objects. And these became known as the diffuse interstellar bands. Uh, there's no atomic or molecular uh, structure that we know that corresponds with these absorptions. And so they remained a mystery for almost 100 years. And just a couple of years before Harry died, or a year before, um, John Mayer and his group actually isolated C60 plus and found that um, it, it coincided beautifully with two of these diffuse interstellar bands, which must have been absolutely amazing for Harry to have that uh, been confirmed. There's an incredible number of a applications for C60 which we haven't got time to go into. Um, I'm now going around doing a joint um, Fuller and Croto science workshops all around the UK and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. And uh, if you're interested, if you put creative science in Google, you can look up a lot of the stuff I do. And I know it's a whirlwind tour, but thank you very, very much for listening. <laughs>